is Radio Nigeria coming to you live from the Central Business District in Abuja. The federal government has announced the June 12th elections and has said it is still committed to completing the eight-year-long transition program by August 27th. The government has given the two political parties, SDP and NRC, until the end of July to submit two new presidential candidates for a new election. The NRC is in favor of fresh elections, but we are still waiting for a response from SDP leadership. The SDP is set to hold its convention later today, but we'll bring you an update as soon as we can. In the meantime, the civil rights organization Campaign for Democracy has called for a nationwide stay-at-home protest, which has brought David, to a standstill. David, please turn that off. This yes, sir. Is... It's Sunday, July 4th, 1993. A black Mercedes-Benz 190 edition is driving towards the presidential villa in Abuja. Moshud Abiola, the lone passenger, is in the back seat. He's on his way to meet Ibrahim Babangida, Nigeria's military president. Abiola had received a phone call from Babangida the night before, requesting that they meet at the villa. The two had not seen or spoken to each other in the three weeks since the election was annulled. The car turns a corner and heads towards the gated entrance. David, the driver, glances at Abiola from the rear view mirror as he slowly pulls the car to a stop in front of the entrance. Abiola is staring straight ahead. His expression is blank, except for the puffiness under his eyes, which revealed that he has not had a good night's sleep for days. There is a knock on the driver's side window, and David quickly lowers the tinted glass. Good morning, sir. The armed soldier on the other side doesn't say a word. Instead, he leans into the driver's side window to look at the back seat, where he sees Abiola. He quickly retreats and motions for the gates to be opened. The driver pulls into the VIP parking area next to a large residential building. Once again, the driver shifts his eyes to the rear view mirror, and this time he makes eye contact with Abiola. Chief. I know it's not my place, but do you think it's a good idea? This man cannot be trusted. Abiola gives a reassuring smile to his driver and nods his head. As he speaks, his voice is weary, but firm. David, my friend, it's your place to speak. But don't worry. If he asks for a meeting with such a tone of urgency, it must be because he has something important to discuss. I am hoping he has good news. I will be going to the SDP party meeting from here. David, I want to have good news. To David, it almost sounds like Abiola is trying to convince himself that this meeting would yield something positive. As usual, Abiola sounded hopeful, but David could sense there was something off. Why would he choose to come to this meeting without other members of the SDP? David quickly shows the thought out of his mind and not. He gets out and opens the passenger door for Abiola. Abiola takes a deep breath as the heels of his black leather Oxfords land heavy on the cobblestones. He gathers his bright yellow flowing abada as he emerges from the car taking extra care to avoid hitting his matching yellow cap against the car roof. Babangida had already been alerted to Abiola's arrival. And as Abiola steps out of the car, he sees Babangida standing at the entrance of the building in his usual military attire. As Abiola is approaching, Babangida motions for his security detail to turn back while he takes a few steps forward to meet Abiola. Ah, Bashoro. Salam alaikum. Babangida's arms are wide open as he offers Abiola the traditional Muslim greeting of peace. Abiola replies quickly and then gets straight to the point. Aleku Salam, why do you want to meet me? Abba Abasha, you just came in. Let us go inside. Perhaps you want uh, refreshments and uh, let, let's see. Why do you want to see me, Ibrahim? Bashan, look, I know the events in the last three weeks have not turned out the way we expected and for this i feel very grieved wallahi you must believe me i had nothing to do with the decision to annul the election 
It's some officers in the army who vehemently opposed my handing over power to you. I swear to you by the Holy Quran, they would have killed us both if the result of the election had not been cancelled. Both of us are over 50. Why should we be afraid to die? Excuse me? Yes, Ibrahim. Why are you afraid of dying? You should have sworn me in first, and then if they kill us both, we will go to heaven holding hands and singing as, as both of friends. Babangida grows silent as he begins to realize the extent to which Abiola is ready to fight for the presidency of Nigeria. Abiola doesn't wait for Babangida to respond. He turns and begins to walk away. Babangida calls out after him. Look, I understand that mistakes have been made, but I want you to still consider me as your very good friend. Friend? Abiola stops for a moment as the word echoes in his head. No good friend would behave like this. Oti, Ibrahim Oti. Basharu, all my decisions as regard the presidential election results were in good faith, I swear. Mr. President, Mr. President, I don't believe a single word you have said. And to shift blame on some imaginary army is like a full-grown man attempting to hide behind one finger. When you have something concrete to tell me, you have my phone numbers. But know this, I will not surrender my mandate. Abiola turns and continues to walk away as he calls out. Ibrahim, not now and not for anything. Whoa. I will not surrender my mandate. I will not surrender my mandate. Babangida watches as Abiola enters the car and drives out of the compound. He knew trying to get Abiola to willingly abandon the June 12 election results was going to be difficult. But now he knows it's impossible. Abiola is emboldened, not just by the number of people who voted for him, but also by the support of his party members. Babangida knows that as long as Abiola feels he has the backing of the SDP, he won't budge. Babangida frowns and heads back inside. Abiola will not like him for what he's about to do, but if it will keep them both alive, then it's worth it. From Triple E Media Productions, I am Ikwamusa Ike Odiasi. And this is Nigerian Headlines. This is season one, June 12th, the annulment. Episode three, the politics of stepping aside. An hour later, Abiola is in Benin for the SDP meeting, which was already underway. The conference room is rowdy, but begins to fall silent as Abiola makes his entrance and walks to the empty seat at the head of the room. I apologize for coming late. Um, gentlemen, it was unavoidable uh, delay. Abiola is careful not to mention that he had just come from meeting with Babangida. He had not informed the SDP members prior to accepting Babangida's invitation because he thought he would have good news to share with them. And since nothing useful came out of the meeting, Abiola figured that there was no point in mentioning it. The party's chief whip, Wale Oshun, a man in his early 40s, brings Abiola up to date on the discussion. We were just discussing how to respond to the ridiculous and Yes. We must decide what the party's position should be henceforth. Yes. The party position will be this. We won a clear victory. Nigerians decided on June 12th that I should lead them on the platform of SDP. And I need to do just that. The party members murmur and nod their heads in agreement. I will not be distracted by a few army officers who supposedly oppose my leadership. We will stand by the result of the election as released by the officials of neck in the 30 states and Abuja. Members continue to nod excitedly, while others raise their fist to show solidarity. <laughs> yes, that is it. Now, we cannot allow them to cheat without the fight. Mm -hmm. See, they don't want to do back it, but uh, we must kick them out. 
the party members cheer louder. Yaradua, who had just flown in from his father's funeral the day before, has been sitting quietly, leaning back in his seat at the opposite end of the conference table. He breaks his silence. I want to say something. He leans forward as everyone in the room turns to give him their attention. Retired Major General Shehu Musa Yaradua is definitely a man they want to pay attention to. He served as Chief of Staff under General Basinger's regime from 1976 to 1979, and then went on to play a very important role in civilian politics. As a founding member of one of the political parties that merged with the SDP, Yaradua yields significant influence over the party. Even after he and others were banned from participating in the government's transition, he continues to influence the party's decision and commands a very loyal following within the party. He begins to address the room. Having taken the decision to cancel the election, the military regime will not likely reverse it. The room is silent, waiting for him to say more. He leans back into his chair. I really have no other comment. Uh, Chief Whip, this is just a thought. The silence grows awkward as junior members of the party look to more senior members, hoping for one of them to elaborate on what Yaradua has said. The senior members know exactly what Yaradua is saying, but they remain quiet. The Chief Whip's voice breaks the silence. Very well, let's move on then. The meeting goes on for an hour longer before coming to an end. The party had resolved that they will not participate in a fresh election and that they will continue to insist that the government release the June 12th election results. But not everyone at the 4th of July meeting agreed with that direction and they knew the federal military government will not react kindly to that position. In fact, by the next day, Monday the 5th of July, Bamangida issued both SDP and the NRC a 48-hour ultimatum that if they don't find a common position and accept fresh elections, they will dissolve all democratic structures. This meant that everything they had created during the eight-year transition period will be dissolved, including the two political parties, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and all the offices of elected officials, including governors. This was no longer about Abiola's mandate. Every politician's job was at stake. With only 48 hours to go, a second meeting was called of a group of senior party members, including former military leader, Ulushegun Obasanjo, Yara Duo, the SDP chairman, Chief Aneni, and others. It was at that meeting that another option was proposed, and it's this proposal that will expose the cracks that had already begun to form within the SDP. It's this proposal that will test SDP's resolve to remain loyal to Abiola, and it's this proposal that will set the stage for Sania Bacha to start making his moves. This is Radio Nigeria, bringing you breaking news from Lagos today, Tuesday, the 6th of July, 1993. Riots and violent protests have broken out here in the city as hundreds of Nigerians protest over the June 12th tournament. The Nigerian Labour Congress, that's the NLC, has announced a general strike by its 4 million members. NANS that's the National Association of Nigerian Students and other civil rights organizations have joined the protest. The Orni of Ife, Alailua Oba Okwade Shijwade Olubushe II, has come out to speak on behalf of the Yoruba Abbas. He has threatened Yoruba secession if Abiola is not declared winner of the election. Even former head of state, General Olushe Gwambasanja, retired has joined in the condemnation, stating 
that this government has shown itself to be at war with its own people and that the people will now react. Indeed, protesters have gone wild and are practically holding towns and communities in a web of tension. Roads are being deserted, government offices and private businesses have been closed down as the action of the protesters remains spontaneous and violent. We're yet to get a reaction from the government, but we will keep you updated as we get more information. It's Tuesday morning, July 6th, 1993. General Sanya Bacha is in the Situation Room at the Defense Headquarters in Lagos. The room is pitch black, except for lights coming from the panel of TV screens displaying news reports from Lagos and other states in the Southwest. Officers are sitting in front of the screens, monitoring the information as it comes through. The general stands in front of one set of screens. The buttons on his military uniform shine bright as they catch the light from the screens. He is looking straight ahead, and based on the reflections from his aviator sunglasses, he is watching footage of government-owned buildings burning up in flames. He continues to watch as an officer walks over to brief him. Sir, the story is the same everywhere, sir. Both on the mainland and the island, the demonstrators have taken over the city. By tomorrow, sir, we expect a total breakdown of law and order. Without taking his eyes from the screens, Abacha replies. Get me the governor. Right away, sir. The officer quickly dials the governor's number and hands the phone to Abacha. Governor, I am afraid I will be a bit blunt. There has been complete breakdown of law and order in Lagos and your government has not done enough to curtail the crisis. The governor's voice comes through the telephone receiver. <laughs> we are in a democratic transition, my general. And people are upset about the environment. But, but my government, we... we we are doing everything we can to put an end to the crisis and... Your people are not doing enough. The army will restore order by force if we have to. We shall not allow anybody to hold the country to ransom. You have 24 hours to restore order in Lagos, Mr. Governor. About your hands the receiver back to the officer and turns to face the TV screens again. If the crisis is not resolved after 24 hours, deploy soldiers to the streets of Lagos and other western states to disrupt the protest and make sure you arrest the leaders of the protest. Yes, sir. Abacha says that the soldier has more to say. He turns to face him. Anything else? Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. A lot of things are happening and me and the other officer are worried. There is a news going around in Abuja about an interim government and yet you said it's not time to move uh, patience patience events are still playing out a lot of things still need to be put in place before we can move in uh, sir if i may be bold my general sir when would that be sir abacha doesn't answer the officer he needs to maintain an element of surprise and his interim government might be the very thing he needs to plant his surprise. A subtle grin crosses over his lips as he turns back to face the TV screen. Pass it down the chain of command. I want a curfew to begin in Lagos and all the western states by 1900 hours today. Yes, sir. It's 11 o'clock at night. Less than 48 hours left for the parties to respond to his ultimatum. And Babangida is standing by the window in his office at the villa. He's holding a single sheet of paper. It's a letter. His wife, Miriam, enters the office. She's dressed in a graceful, long, loose garment with a veil covering her head and shoulders. Dear, it's getting late. Please come to bed. Babangida turns and Miriam can immediately see that something is wrong. What is it? I just received this proposal. It's for an interim national government to succeed my regime. Babangida walks over to one of the sofas in his office and sits. Miriam sits next to him. The concept itself is very good. It would allow 
the retention of all democratic structures at local, state, and national assembly levels. Then what is wrong? What I can't agree with is the presidential council being proposed to oversee the interim arrangement. It completely excludes me. It leaves me out of the equation. Hmm. Well, how about you embrace the proposal, but edit it to your taste? Hmm. That's a good idea. Yes, since you already said the option is good, you can just find a way to edit yourself back into the equation. Babangida nods his head in agreement. An interim national government where power is shared between the two political parties and the federal military government might work. It will certainly allow him to keep his promise of transitioning by August 27th, and it will save him from having to conduct a new election, which would most certainly end in chaos and a coup. But how is he going to get the SDP and NRC to agree to this? NRC would agree because it would allow them to get around their defeat on June 12th and still get its members into government. But Abiola and some of the SDP members have drawn a hard line based on the June 12th election result. So they will not agree to his proposal. The only way is to meet directly with the party chairman. Babangida glances at his watch. 15 minutes to midnight. He reaches for the phone on his office desk. Operator, yes, connect me with the SDP chairman, yes, Chief Tony Aneni. Enter please. Yes, let's see, sir. The uh, SDP chairman, uh, uh, Chief uh, Tony Aneni, and his uh, delegation, they are here to see you, sir. Good. Send them in. Yes, sir. It's morning, Wednesday, 7th of July, and less than 18 hours before the deadline for the political parties and the federal government to come to some form of agreement on the way forward. Babangida has invited the chairman of both parties, the SDP and NRC, to a meeting. Getting the NRC to agree to the proposal for an interim national government will not be a problem. But SDP leaders require some other form of motivation in order to submit to the proposal. The door to the office opens. Ah, Chief Tony Aneni. Mr. President. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Babangida greets the chief and his delegation at the door and walks them over to the sitting area. Ah, uh, chief, how is the family? We are well, Mr. President. The coffee table had already been set with coffee, tea, and light refreshments for the guests. The president gestures for them to help themselves as he continues making light conversation. You know, it's good to know that one's friend will remain as true as you do in such trying times as this. Thank you, Mr. President. I told Abiola the same thing when you came to see me this Saturday. Babangida catches the sharp look of surprise that flashes across the chief's eyes, and he smiles as he continues hosting his guests. Please, sit. Make yourselves comfortable. <laughs> We will wait for the NRC delegation. I'm sure they are on their way already. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As the president walks out of the earshot, one of the party members whispers, Can you imagine? Abila came to see the president four days ago, and he didn't mention anything of this nature. What else is going on behind her back? Be patient, gentlemen. Let's see what the president has to offer. Then we will draw a conclusion afterwards. Yeah. 
It's 9 p.m. later that same day, Wednesday, July 7th, in Nikon Noga Hotel in Abuja. The SDP's chief whip, Wale Oshi, is walking quickly towards the conference hall where leaders of the SDP had been meeting with leaders of the NRC for the past eight hours. Earlier that morning, the chairman of the two parties and their delegates had met with Babangida to discuss a proposal that will end the impasse between the political parties and the federal government. The proposal was for an interim national government that will be made up of the SDP, NRC, and members of the federal government. As Wale makes his way up the stairs, he could hear the party members' voices coming from the conference hall. He reaches the door and enters. The entire hall is in disarray. Chairs are scattered everywhere, and the party members are standing around in small clusters. Everybody's talking at the same time. Chief Tony Aneni, the SDP chairman, is standing in the middle of the room trying to bring the room to order. Honorable members of the National Executive of NRC and SDP, this is the document containing our joint decisions on the present June 12th crisis. Chief and then he waves a piece of paper in the air. He lowers it to eye level and begins to read it out loud. We agree to cooperate fully with the federal military government to ensure a speedy resolution of the present political impasse. To this end, the two parties accepted in principle the second option of a national government proposed by the federal military government, but would suggest that in view of the implications of the option, a committee comprising representatives of the two political parties to be set up to work out the composition, tenor, and other issues pertaining to the setting up of a national government. Now, the chairman and two secretaries, both of both parties, yes. will append their signature to the paper. And now, voices rise in opposition. While he pushes his way to the center of the room, as his own voice rises above the rest. What has happened here? What has happened here? Have we all had collective amnesia? Were we not all at the meeting in Benin? Chief Aneni, this is not the mandate the party gave us for this meeting. Okay, sir. Okay. And okay. what is the mandate? One, that we are to make the victory of June 12th presidential election the central issue of the meeting. Yeah, that. Two, we are to discuss all the type of government of national unity that can be formed which would be agreeable with the presidential system according to the prescription of our constitutions. Fact, fact, fact. And three, we are to negotiate the ministerial positions that both sides will concede towards the formation of a government of national unity. <laughs> Chief Aneni waits patiently for the noise to die down. G gentlemen, gentlemen. Chief Aneni turns to face the chief whip. As much as I and every SDP member here, mm -hmm. respect that position. Yes. There are new exigencies that have made our initial position untenable. Exigencies? That is the exigency. Let him finish. Let him finish. What exigencies? The chief lets out a deep sigh and turns to face the rest of the room. He gestures with the fingers of his right hand as he speaks. One. The chief extends his thumb into the air. Babangida may not have full control over the military. Reversing the annulment will most certainly trigger a military coup against this government. Yes. Yeah, Two. His index finger rises. It will be suicidal for us to confront a military government populated by soldiers. Trained in combat. Yeah, I have you want to talk. You see? There will be blood shed. You see? Our blood will be shed. Three. Babangida still has loyalties. And if we are not careful, 
they could use this as an opportunity to create chaos yes. than justify their stay in power. Yes. Exactly. Chief Anini holds three fingers in the air as he looks out into the room. He can see the reality of what he's saying starting to sink in. One by one, the men begin to take their seats. The chief lowers his hand, lets out another deep sigh, and continues. Gentlemen, we must focus all our energy on making sure Babangida is forced out of power. Yes. This interim national government might be the best way to get him out. <laughs> Once he's out, we can all have another shot at the presidency. <laughs> at the mention of the presidency, Wale's attention is drawn to the attendees in the room. He scans the room and he notices that someone is missing. He turns to Chief Aneni. Chief, where is Abiola? This is Radio Nigeria broadcasting from Lagos, and we are bringing you updates on the June 12 announcement. After extensive meetings, the leadership of the SDP and NRC issued a joint statement late last night, Wednesday the 7th of July, in favor of the interim national government option. But the devil, as they say, is in the details. Who will form this national government? How will it work? How long will it operate before the new election will be held? And perhaps the most pressing question at this time, who will head the interim government? It's Thursday morning, 8th of July. Abiola is seated at a round table in a small conference room at his mansion in Ikeja. The SDP executive members, which include the national chairman, Chief Tuni Aneni, are seated at the table with him. None of the men had gotten a good night's sleep and emotions are still raw from the night before. Everyone's expression appears solemn as the weight of the decision they took last night begins to sink in. Abiola leans forward towards the center of the table. Hey, Chief, we could have kept fighting. What happened? Eh? We could have beaten them. We had and we still have the support of over 14 million Nigerians. And even more people have come out to fight for us ever since this annulment. Even members of the military are behind us. You have seen some of them even offer to resign over the annulment. If that is not enough, the international community is even behind us. The U.S., they cancelled the aid package that they had promised to Nigeria. Even the UK stopped all military aid and won't issue any visa to, to the military. We have support. Why did you agree to the interim government? There's silence as Chief Anini leans forward to meet Abiola's gaze. If the Americans really care, why did they not impose oil sanctions? They stopped the aid package. So what? Do you think the military survives on aid packages? As long as they are still buying oil from the federal military government, these are empty gestures from the U.S. Aburumi, don't mistake it for support. Mm. Anyway, what is done is done. We have to think about the next step. Uh, what do we like? Hey, Chief, what? Abiola cuts him off. He's not ready to move on. People died for us. They died for me to restore my market. What do we tell them? Eh? Eh? That they died for nothing. There are people still in jail. Becky is still in jail. Ghana is still in jail. Falana is still in jail. What do we do about these people? Their fight will not be in vain. We can still use this interim national government to push the SDP agenda ah. and the June 12th mandate. Ah. We see half upper hand here. We can insist that the national government formed with the NRC will be on the basis of the June 12 election. Uh, with you and King Jibe as the head of government, we can share the remaining positions with NRC. 
Chief Aneni's words might as well be empty promises to Abiola. The party has already betrayed the June 12th mandate once by signing on to the interim national government. Why should he believe that they will not abandon it a second time? <laughs> what if the NLC does not agree? What if the federal military government does not agree? What will the party do then? Eh? Chief Aneni can read between the lines. Abiola is asking for assurances that the party will fight for the June 12th mandate no matter what. That they will fight to ensure he becomes Nigeria's next president. What will the party do if these people do not agree? The party will do whatever it needs to be done to survive. We will survive. Ah. With that response, Abiola knows he cannot rely on the party. But he has invested so much into this SDP. Even though he had just joined the party in January six months before the election he had invested so much money abiola knows what he has to do he has to continue the fight and if that means that he has to let some of the sdp members go then he will let them go it's almost midnight tuesday the 3rd of august 1993 and for the first time in almost a month, Babangida is able to relax. He is in the lounge reviewing the final report from the Trapatite Committee. The committee consisted of representatives from the federal military government, the SDP, and the NRC executive members. And they had most of July and into the first week of August negotiating the operational details of the interim national government, the ING. Each group had specific demands for how the ING should operate. The military insisted that Babangida must step down and could not be involved in any way with the ING. His own generals felt that, given the way he handled June 12th, he had lost the credibility to remain head of state. Yaradua, on behalf of SDP, demanded that ING should be headed by a civilian. He also insisted that Babangida and his vice president, Aihumu, and all service chiefs should resign. Babangida could see himself agreeing to these demands, all except one. Enter. The door opens slightly, and a military officer enters. Your Excellency, sir. Professor Omo Omowi is here to see you, sir. Please, bring him in. Yes, sir. The door opens wider now, and Professor Moro is ushered into the lounge. He is met by Babangida's outstretched arms as the general welcomes him with a smile. Oh. <laughs> My professor, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. This is a different man than the one I met a few weeks ago, the professor thinks to himself. Babangida takes Professor Moro by the hand and leads him to the sofa. To the professor, it's as if Babangida can barely contain his excitement. Rejoice with me, Prof. We finally have a breakthrough. Babangida sits next to the professor and hands him a document. Professor Omori quickly dips his hands into his suit jacket, retrieves his eyeglasses, and begins to skim the document. Um, these recommendations, Your Excellency, it will mean you're no longer in the equation. Are you... Um, okay? Am I okay with it? Yes, my professor. As long as it means uh, I can continue to live and fight another day, I will sign it. <sighs> uh, but I, it also means you have to retire other service chiefs. Will they want Yes. To... Yes. They will all retire. Babangida suddenly stands up and starts to pay. So, but there's one person I cannot retire. And that is General Sani Abacha. Babangida stops pacing in time to see Professor Mori's reaction. A look of both surprise and worry crosses over the professor's face. Babangida rushes to explain. Look, Omo, I appreciate my dilemma here. Sani is the only insurance against a successful coup after I leave. He's also the only guarantee of harmony in the military. Do you really believe that? I think he's powerful, uncontrollable, and dangerous. 
Yes, but I have a plan to reduce Sally's powers. I will separate policy leadership from operational leadership. Sunny will remain as Secretary of Defense and lead policy while I put Dovo Yaro in charge of Chief of Defense staff. That's the best I can do. The rest of the service chiefs have to retire. Sunny will have nothing to do with them. Somehow, this plan doesn't sit well with Professor Omori. Can I speak plainly, Your Excellency? Yes, of course, carry on. I don't foresee a peaceful coexistence between Abacha and Dogoyaro after your departure. In fact, I think it's going to be a total chaos. Babangida knows that Professor Amoriyu has a point. Abacha and Dogoyaro have been at odds with one another for years. Dogoyaro has always felt that Abacha is an opportunist who just found himself to be at the right place at the right time. Abacha resented how Dongo Yaro always seemed to want to get in the way of his ambitions. Hmm, prof, it's not the best situation, but at least this way maybe they can checkmate each other. No, they can't. The professor thinks, but he says nothing. Babangida is underestimating the power that Abacha holds over the military. For years, he has failed to depoliticize the military and has allowed the professional cool merchants among them to thrive. While he was busy setting up democratic structures for civilian rule, the politicized members of the military were busy planning for their own turn to rule. And now, not only is he not retiring Major General Sani Abacha, he is appointing him as the only serving military officer in the interim national government. Professor Amori is certain that somehow, some way, after all the dust settles, Abacha will be the only man standing. This is Radio Nigeria coming to you from Lagos. New developments in the transition program indicate that the two parties, SDP and NRC, will cooperate with the federal military government to form an interim national government. Some conditions for the ING include that a civilian must be the head of the ING, but it's not clear at the moment which civilian will be picked. There may still be an opportunity for anyone, including the flag bearers of either party, to make a comeback and become selected as the next head of state. It's Wednesday, 4th August 1993 in Lagos. The streets are bustling this morning as the coffee lifts and people head to work. General Sonia Bacha sits at his desk, flipping through the morning newspapers. The protests that rocked the country and left the Southwest paralyzed have subsided. The protests were more than just about Abiola and the June 12th mandate. Many were angry at being taken for granted. Nigerians had waited patiently through a long, windy transition with many twists and turns, only now to be told they must continue to wait. For how much longer? The strength of their demonstrations began to fade when they started to realize that there was no mass protest coming from the politicians who had the most to lose. So why should they cry more than the bereaved? Abacha tosses the paper aside and picks up the television remote control. As he's about to turn on the TV, there's a knock at his office door. Come in. A soldier enters. He's one of Abacha's many loyalists. General, sir, according to one of our informants in Abuja, the two parties have agreed to the interim national government, sir. Abacha responds without looking up. I know that already. It's on the news. <laughs> sir, our sources tell us that a group within the SDP is still trying to ensure the interim national government is on the basis of the June 12th results. Sir, they are even pushing to get Abiola to be the head of the ING, sir. This piques Abacha's interest and he turns to look at the soldier. He knows that Babangida has not made a decision about who will head the ING. 
And since that position is essentially a death sentence for anyone appointed into it, he knows that Babangida will not select Abiola. But then again, Babangida is not in full control of his decisions. And he does have a reputation for making last-minute erratic moves. After all, there is a reason why his nickname is the Maradona. If for whatever reason, Abiola is appointed head of the ING, there is no way that Abacha will be able to remove him. The national and international reaction to such a move would be too overwhelming even for him to manage. Abacha dismisses the officer. You may go. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. The officer takes his leave as Abacha reaches for the phone on his desk. Operator, connect to Abiola. Yes, his office line. Across town in Ikeja, Abiola is having a meeting with his SDP faction at his home office when his phone rings. His personal assistant answers and immediately whispers something into Abiola's ear. Without hesitation, Abiola interrupts his meeting. Uh, gentlemen, I have to take this in private. He quietly excuses himself and moves to another room to receive the call. Hello? Asano al Haji. Abiola knows that voice. My general. I have some bad news, Al Haji. Bad news? What is it? Um, intelligence reports reaching me suggest your life is in imminent danger. Okay. At first, Abiola is not too shocked by this. As a presidential candidate, he was used to hearing that one of his political enemies will come after him. He and his family had already been living under heavy security since he declared his candidacy. But this sounded like a new threat, one that he may not survive. A very strong carcass in the armed forces opposed to the actualization of the June 12th mandate has issued orders to have you terminated. What? Abiola starts to panic as he sits at his desk, clutching the phone receiver with both hands. It was one thing for a political opponent to come after him. It's another when it's the armed forces. Can't you do something about it? I am afraid not. They accelerated the timetable. The best option now is a tactical withdrawal. Leave the country, possibly tonight. You can get to London by morning. I have already detailed some of my most trusted men to provide escorts for you till you get to the airport. Uh, but my mandate... Uh, your mandate, sir, will mean nothing if you are gunned down. Leave tonight. Call me when you are in the air. I, I have to go now. Don't worry, everything will be alright. Ah, 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 ah. Abiola's head is reeling and everything in front of him appears blurry. He tries to stand up, but his legs are weak. He drops his head into the palm of his hands and tries to take deep breaths. Just then, his personal assistant walks into the room. Sir, is everything all right? The party members are waiting on you. Uh, what? Um, um, I, I won't be seeing anybody again tonight. Eh? Tell them something has come up. Call my pilot and tell him to be on standby. We are traveling tonight, Shogbo. Okay, sir. A few hours later, Abiola is on a flight en route to London. And from there, he will eventually travel to the United States. For about two months, Abiola will be out of the country. In Nigerian politics, a lot can happen in two months. And with Abiola out of the picture, it's enough time for a series of decisions and events to unfold and eventually make way for Sunny Abacha to assume power as Nigeria's next military head of state. Nigerian Headlines is a Triple E Media Production. Production Copyright 2022 Triple E Media Production. This is Season 1, June 12th. The Annulment, based on the comic book novel June 12th, 1993 Annulment by Abraham Oshoko. This episode 
was directed by John Iwodi, written by Ramat Muhammad and John Iwodi, produced by Senate Ewa, executive producer Ramat Muhammad, narrated by Ikbomosa Ike Odiase, Chris Maledo as Moshud Kashimawo Abiola and Professor Omo Omoruyi. Jide Balariwa as Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida. Michael Atungu as Sani Abacha. Special thanks to the following voices. Jude Audu, Blessing Joel Akapson, Godwin Irabo, Gilbert Onwa, George Washington, Ijen Ewe Harrison, Uchechuku Obiako, Charlotte Inyam, Adeniyi Kunu, Miriam Mohammed, Antonieta Kalunta, Rabia Adejia, Loki Usama, John Iwodi, Dominic Tabakaji, and Uche Mba. Sound recording, Sam Tabakaji and Dominic Tabakaji. Sound editing, Sam Tabakaji. Sound design, Dominic Tabakaji and Ramat Muhammad. Mixing and mastering, Dominic Tabakaji. Cover art by Pixel Craft Multimedia. In most cases, we cannot know exactly what was said, but all of our reenactments are based on research. We would like to thank Abraham Oshoko for granting us the right to adapt his novel into audio form. We also relied on additional sources of information, including Nigerian Soldiers of Fortune series, written by Max Chiolun. <laughs>